Well, I'll make an effort to live up to the reputation of being disreputable. But, uh, <laughs> uh, I was asked to talk about an important topic, uh, dilemmas in a humanitarian intervention. And there are a number of very striking dilemmas. Uh, one question that arises about humanitarian intervention is whether the category even exists. Are there examples of it? And uh, that, that's a serious question. I'll talk about it. The, uh, it's kind of surprising in many ways that you should even ask the question because there are so many perfectly straightforward and simple forms of humanitarian intervention which could have a, a massive uh, effect and cost virtually nothing. Uh, so, for example, according to the, uh, the Lancet, the leading world medical journal in England, uh, uh, six million uh, infants die every year just from a uh, lack of, uh, from the failure to apply very simple procedures, which would cost almost nothing. Uh, the, there are some, I just happen to have come from a conference in Norway of a group called uh, Academic Stand Against uh, Poverty, uh, where Norwegian jock doctors talked about this, and uh, uh, their political scientists pointed out that they've done studies, and it shows that uh, a tiny percentage of the GDP uh, of uh, the rich countries would suffice to save six million uh, infants every year. Uh, that's not a small number, and there are many other uh, similar things. Uh, that's uh, elementary forms of humanitarian intervention. Uh, no controversies about doing it, uh, no votes at the United Nations, uh, just a willingness to spend what amounts to pennies on the part of the rich countries. Uh, nevertheless, it is uh, a question whether the this doesn't exist, and we can ask whether the uh, general category exists. Actually, that question arises uh, right away in the first uh, serious uh, essay about the topic of humanitarian intervention term, it's 1859, the term doesn't used, wasn't used, but that's what it's about. Uh, this is an essay by uh, John Stuart Mill, and it's of particular significance, not only because of its content, it is kind of the classical essay on the topic, uh, but because of who he was. He was a man of uh, unusual uh, moral integrity, uh, intelligence, uh, pretty hard to match him. And it turns out that with a few changes of names, uh, the content of his essay could appear today, I think. I uh, don't want to, I'll, I'll quote you some of the central parts. I don't want to paraphrase. Uh, Mill, there was a view in England at the time, this is the late 1850s, that uh, England, which was of course the world's hegemonic power of the day, that England should uh, keep away from intervention uh, unless, I'm quoting him, unless its safety is threatened or any of its interests uh, hostily and unfairly are endangered. Uh, but uh, Mill objected to that standard view. He thought that was a mistake. And the reason was he said that England uh, is a novelty in the world. It's a remarkable nation that acts only in the service of others. It's dedicated to peace, but if the aggressions of barbarians force it to a successful war, it selflessly bears the cost, while the fruits it shares in fraternal equality with the whole human race. That even includes the barbarians that it conquered for their own benefit. Uh, he does say that England has a fault, uh, misplaced modesty. That leads... Uh, Englishmen to abnegate the character which we might with truth lay claim to of being incomparably the most conscientious of all nations in our national acts. Uh, England is not only peerless but near perfect. It has no aggressive designs. It desires no benefit to itself at the expense of others. Its policies are blameless and laudable. Uh, and he went on to say that England should not be deterred by the fact that it is held up to obloquy on the continent 
Uh, incidentally, the thoughts of others outside the continent don't enter into this question, including those who uh, uh, Adam Smith uh, referred to long before when he condemned the what he called the savage injustice of the Europeans, particularly the vile acts of the British in India, uh, but not by 1859. It's only that we, uh, England, uh, 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 receives uh, obloquy on the uh, continent, held up obloquy on the continent. Uh, but he nevertheless said, despite this, uh, uh, England should be ready to intervene in the service of others, of course. Uh, however, its motives may be misrepresented by those who cannot believe the uh, magnificence that is before their eyes and attribute the cynical motives to the British. Uh, it's, he's a great philosopher. He went in to study the criteria for intervention, and he said it's permissible when dealing with barbarians, those with a low degree of civilization whose minds are not capable of comp comprehending rules, uh, let alone observing them. These barbarians, which is essentially everyone outside of Europe, um, even outside of England, uh, they need the protection of a civilized power of Christian Europe, uh, particularly, of course, the noblest among them. Well, uh, uh, Mill was, it's interesting to look at the timing of when Mill was writing. It was 1859. That was right after the public exposure, very public exposure, of Britain's vicious atrocities in India in suppressing what in British history is called the Indian Mutiny, the rebellion in India. Uh, this was, uh, I might tell you how uh, Jawaharlal Nehru described it in his History of India, written from his prison cell. He was imprisoned by the British. Uh, he described it as uh, a ghastly and horrible picture showing man at his worst, uh, citing contemporary records, both British and Indian, which are quite accurate. Uh, this, incidentally, was not long after the Irish famine, horrible Irish famine, in which the uh, England's role was not obscure. It was, it was also in the midst of the Second Opium War, that was 1856 to 1860. This is right in the middle of it when Mill was writing. And that had its own uh, horrors, uh, bombardment and, and deliberate burning down of uh, thousands of houses and densely settled the canton, for example, with many killed. Now, that had caused such an uproar in England that uh, Parliament was dissolved and a new election was called, all of this shortly before Mill wrote. And of course, he knew all about it. He was an educated, literate person. He was also a, an official of the East India Company, which was right at the center of the atrocities in India. Uh, well, that's the context. Uh, in short, uh, we can say that uh, England was the 19th century counterpart of today's, I'm now quoting, today's idealistic new world bent on ending in humanity uh, in a noble phase of its foreign policy, uh, pursuing policies with a saintly glow. I'm quoting the New York Times, uh, leading commentators uh, in the 1990s. Uh, at the end of the 90s, the nation reached the height of its glory, uh, acting from altruism and moral fervor alone. It's a historian. David Frumkin, uh, dedicating itself for the first time in history to principles and values instead of self-interest, uh, Václav Havel, and thus uh, opening a new era of enlightenment, uh, very much like uh, England, the England that Mill was describing. Uh, well, uh, that uh, uh, raises some questions, plainly. Uh, if that's the peak of... Uh, nobility of humanitarian intervention, exactly what is humanitarian intervention? I should say that uh, the, the, there was very little writing about humanitarian intervention uh, after Mill and up till the 1990s. That's when the flurry of writing and discussion and uh, the concept really reached you know, public attention, became a major topic of international uh, uh, efforts and uh, discussion and 
uh, debate and discussion in uh, intellectual circles. Uh, we might ask, why the 1990s? Well, uh, a cynic might have an answer, and being disreputable, I tend to uh, think that the cynical answer is correct. Now, there were plenty of interventions before 1990, but they always had a pretext, reflexive pretext. Whatever the circumstances, they were defense against the uh, hideous enemy, the, uh, the monolithic and ruthless conspiracy uh, aiming to take over the world, uh, John F. Kennedy's description. And, of course, to defend ourselves against that and defend the civilization against that, it was necessary to carry out uh, interventions which killed millions of people, destroyed countries, and overthrew democratic governments, and so on. I won't run through it. Uh, but by 1990, that pretext was gone. Uh, the uh, ruthless conspiracy had disappeared. Uh, so some, the cynic would say, some new pretext is uh, needed for intervention. And in fact, policies didn't change after 1990 in quite interesting ways. If you want to if anyone wants to understand the Cold War, the obvious place to look is what happened right after the fall of the Berlin Wall, when all of the pretexts for U.S. Uh, actions in the so-called Third World, which is where the Cold War was fought, uh, all of them disappeared. So what happened after 1989, after the fall of the wall? Well, one obvious question is what happened to NATO? Uh, NATO was established with the for official reason was to defend Western Europe from the Russian hordes. Uh, 1989, no more Russian hordes. Uh, so what happens to NATO? Uh, anyone who believed any of the propaganda of the preceding 50 years would have expected NATO to be dissolved. No more hordes coming. Uh, what happened is the opposite. It expanded. Uh, in violation of uh, uh, prom promises to uh, uh, Gorbachev. Uh, Gorbachev had agreed to the unification of Germany and incorporation in a Western military alliance, which is quite a concession if you look at history. Germany alone had virtually destroyed Russia several times in the century, but he was agreeing to letting it join a, a Western military alliance on a condition the condition was that NATO would not expand one inch to the east. That was the phrase used by President Bush and Secretary of State Baker. Well, that meant it wouldn't extend to eastern Germany. Uh, NATO immediately expanded to eastern Germany, then farther east. Uh, by now, it's a uh, Gorbachev incidentally was furious, but when he brought this up, uh, uh, James Baker and Bush pointed out to him that these were only gentlemen's agreements. They had been very careful never to put it on paper. And if he was stupid enough to believe uh, a promise by Western diplomats, that's his problem. Uh, anyway, NATO expanded to the east. Uh, then it expanded further. It's by now a global U.S.-run intervention force. Its official task, official, is to uh, guard... Uh, the global energy system, pipelines, uh, uh, you know, naval, naval lanes, uh, sea lanes, and so on, and in general to act as a global U.S. intervention force. Well, that's NATO. Uh, what about U.S. Uh, policy itself? Well, the first, there was an uh, intervention right after uh, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall. The U.S. invaded Panama, it killed probably a couple thousand people, uh, uh, instituted a puppet government. Uh, uh, the goal was to kidnap a minor thug who had stopped following orders. He had been a loyal uh, killer and murderer, uh, but he was out getting out of line, so the U.S. invaded. Uh, kind of a footnote to history. Uh, so common. It was a little different because it had a new pretext. Uh, the pretext wasn't the Russians are coming, but uh, uh, there's a um, Hispanic narco traffickers are trying to destroy the United States, and we have to go after them, about as plausible as the Russians are coming. Uh, there was also an interesting comment on the invasion by uh, 
Elliot Abrams, who had been Under Secretary of State in the Reagan administration until he was removed for uh, lying to Congress and felonies and so on, then reinstated. Uh, he pointed out accurately that this was the first time that the U.S. could intervene anywhere without concern that there might be a Russian reaction somewhere. They wouldn't try to block U.S. intervention, not that crazy, but they might do something somewhere else. However, not this time, so it was safe intervention. Uh, there were also uh, uh, foreign policy decisions made right away. And again, anyone who wants to understand the Cold War would, have, would look exactly at these. Uh, the Bush administration, this is Bush one, uh, immediately uh, uh, instituted a new national security strategy and passed a defense budget, uh, which were quite interesting. You should read them. I've reviewed them, if you like. Uh, basically, what they said is everything is going to remain exactly as before, but with new pretexts. So we still need a huge military system. It's roughly comparable to the rest of the world combined. It's not to defend ourselves from the Russians. It's because of, literally, the technological sophistication of third world powers. You're not supposed to laugh if you're a well-educated uh, uh, intellectual and academic and nobody laughed. So that's why we need this huge military system. We still need huge intervention forces aimed at the Middle East. And then comes an interesting phrase. Uh, aimed at the Middle East where the serious problems that we faced could not have been laid at the Kremlin's door. In other words, sorry folks, we've been lying to you for 50 years. It's really independent nationalism. Now we can't lie anymore, so it wasn't the Kremlin that was responsible. We still need them. Uh, we still need uh, to maintain what's called the defense industrial base. It's a kind of a euphemism for high-tech industry, uh, largely uh, financed, supported, in fact, uh, initiated in many respects by the state uh, under the pretext of uh, defense, but uh, now we've got to maintain it, but for other reasons. Well, those are the major changes, non-changes, after the uh, fall of the wall, the you know, disappearance of the Soviet Union, but there was an ideological change, too. A large, a sudden interest in uh, the concept of humanitarian intervention. A lot, by, since then, huge literature and so on. Uh, so, going back to the cynical interpretation, one might suggest a new pretext was needed for intervention. Well, you can decide that. Uh, this went on through the 90s. Uh, finally, in 1999, came the jewel in the crown the bombing of Serbia, the Kosovo bombing. And that's what elicited a lot of this uh, elevated uh, rhetoric that I mentioned about principles and values for the first time, pure altruism and so on. Uh, the bombing of, in Kosovo is one of the best documented uh, uh, events in, maybe in history, certainly in modern history. Uh, we have two massive State Department uh, compilations of events that took place prior to the bombing. Uh, we have NATO records. We have uh, UN records. Uh, we have the Br British parliamentary inquiry into it. Uh, uh, there were monitors on the ground, uh, OSCE monitors reporting regularly. All that's available. Uh, this documentation is not only massive, but uniform. It concludes that it was a pretty ugly place with uh, you know, some level of atrocities going on, divided between the Serbs and uh, the KLA, the guerrilla force that was mostly attacking from uh, Albania. And it was pretty well divided. I mean, the British, the most hawkish element of the coalition, they actually thought that the KLA was responsible for most of the atrocities. Well, that was what was going on up until March 1999. Uh, at that point, a decision was made to bomb. And the question was, well, what's going to happen? Uh, the uh, general in charge, General Clark, uh, 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 spoke to the, uh, Link the Clinton White House, uh, Secretary of State Albright, uh, uh, National Security Advisor Berger. We have the records. Uh, and he told, they asked him, well, what's going to happen if you bomb? He said, well, if we bomb, 
the Serb Serbs obviously can't react to our bombing, but they'll react where they're strong. They'll react on the ground. So they'll carry out atrocities on the ground. Uh, that'll be the effect of the bombing. Then he was asked, well, what do you do then? They say, we bomb more. Uh, when the bombing started at the end of March, he informed the press that it is predictable, his words, that there will be atrocities. Yes, for the reason that he mentioned. And indeed there were. Uh, the bombing started about a week after the UN registered its first refugees. Uh, then there were uh, a lot of people, there was ethnic cleansing, people driven out, plenty of atrocities. Uh, Milosevic, Sir Prime Minister, was brought to the International Criminal Court. He was indicted right in the middle of the war. If you look at the indictment, Every charge but one has to do with post-bombing atrocities. Well, that's not a, a proper story. So it's been inverted. If you look at the literature on the subject, you know, academic journalism, uh, it turns out that uh, the U.S. The NATO bombed in order to prevent, the, to put an end to the ethnic cleansing that was going on. So it was a wonderful humanitarian intervention, pure altruism, and so on and so forth. Uh, well... I'll leave that as it stands. Uh, it was not accepted that way in the third world. In fact, it was bitterly condemned in most of the world outside of Europe. The, uh, the governments of the South, as it's called, there was uh, bitterly condemned and jointly, there's a, what they called the so-called right of humanitarian intervention, which they described as just a new version of imperialism. That's most of the world. And that continued right through the following years, same attitude. Uh, at that point, a new concept was developed. Apparently, humanitarian intervention wasn't going to work, so we needed a new concept. Now, that's what's called uh, responsibility to protect, R2P. It's called big thing in international affairs literature. Now, R2P is quite interesting. There's two versions of it. One version was accepted by the United Nations General Assembly in 2005. It passed a responsibility to protect uh, resolution. And virtually every country signed it. The same countries that condemned the so-called right of humanitarian intervention. The reason's pretty straightforward. If you read it, it's almost entirely innocuous. It just repeats positions already taken with slightly more emphasis on the need for uh, the responsibility of countries to protect their own populations, but essentially nothing new. That's one version. Now, that's the version that's referred to when you read that the whole world accepts the responsibility to protect. There's another version, a Western version. It was, uh, it's discussed and it's developed in a, uh, a commission study uh, run by Gareth Evans, former Australian Prime Minister, the Evans Commission. Uh, they came out with a long report uh, uh, which discussed the responsibility to protect. And that's, uh, that's uh, the one that's actually applied. It's very much like the world resolution with one crucial distinction. It provides for NATO and NATO alone to intervene freely anywhere without authorization from the Security Council. Now, it doesn't put it in those words. What it says is, if the Security Council cannot agree on uh, to authorize intervention, then uh, regional groupings can act on their own within the region of their authority, uh, subject to later approval or non-approval by the Security Council. Well, there's only one regional grouping that can do that. Uh, you know, not, uh, you know, not the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Uh, the one regional grouping that can do it is NATO. And their regional, the region of their authority is whatever they say, uh, the world, for example. So in effect, that means uh, responsibility to protect uh, comes down to granting NATO, meaning the US, uh, Britain, maybe some followers, the right to use military force at will. Of course, the world doesn't accept that. But in Western doctrine, that's the responsibility to protect. And it's justified by the claim that the whole world accepts it, uh, as you can see by looking at the General Assembly resolution, 
which is the same except for barring this provision. Well, that's more on uh, humanitarian intervention. Uh, as the literature expanded in the 90s, uh, scholarship expanded with it, with scholarly studies of humanitarian intervention. And they're interesting to read. Uh, one of the main ones is by Sean Murphy, a uh, major book, Scholarly Study on Humanitarian Intervention. Uh, he works pretty hard to try to find examples, and he doesn't find many. In fact, the ones he finds are kind of interesting. So between the two world wars, literally between the Kellogg-Briand Pact, which outlawed war and World War II, uh, he finds three examples of humanitarian intervention. Uh, one was the Italian invasion of Ethiopia, the second was the Japanese invasion of Manchuria and North China, and the third was Hitler's takeover of uh, parts of Czechoslovakia. Now, of course, he doesn't mean to say that these were, in fact, humanitarian interventions. What he means to say is they had all the usual properties of humanitarian intervention. They were kind of like Moot Mill, or what I read from the 1990s. They were the people who carried the, the declarations were just suffused with the most uh, humanitarian, uh, noble rhetoric. So therefore, they were humanitarian interventions. Uh, Mussolini was going to Christianize the pagans. Uh, the Japanese were going to bring an earthly paradise to the people they were slaughtering. Uh, Hitler was going to end ethnic conflicts, uh, and bring the benefits of a superior civilization to this uh, troubled region. And uh, furthermore, it's, in, s in some of these cases at least, there's pretty good reason to believe that they meant it. We have very good records, on, especially on the Japanese conquests. I actually wrote about them 45 years ago. The Rand Corporation released a massive set of records on a Japanese counterinsurgency doctrine. I wrote an article, if you want to look at it, just reviewing a lot of them. And it, it's internal discussion, and there's every reason to believe it was sincere. Uh, they really convinced themselves that uh, they were sacrificing themselves, just like Mill, sacrificing themselves for the benefit of the poor Chinese, uh, protecting them from Chinese bandits, uh, bringing about an earthly paradise. They were sacrificing blood and money and so on. It was utterly noble, uh, just like uh, everything we're familiar with in the West. And it's possible that uh, maybe Hitler believed the same thing and maybe Mussolini. Well, those are the cases he could find of humanitarian intervention. There are cases where uh, intervention has had uh, benevolent effects, that's for sure. Uh, since the Second World War, uh, there are two major examples, uh, one both in the 1970s. Uh, one was 1971 when India... Uh, intervened in East Pakistan, what's now Bangladesh, uh, and put an end to uh, Pakistani atrocities, which were killing tens, hundreds, thousands of people, horrifying atrocities. Uh, India intervened and put an end to it, and East Pakistan separated from West Pakistan, it's now Bangladesh. Now, that was a case that really did have uh, major humanitarian benign effects. Uh, nobody calls it humanitarian intervention because that wasn't India's goal. Now, they had their own power reasons, but that was the effect. Uh, the other major example uh, was uh, 1979 when uh, uh, Vietnam invaded Cambodia and drove out the Khmer Rouge, put an end to Pol Pot's crimes just at the point where they were peaking. Uh, they were driven, and that again had... Uh, Vietnam could have did, I don't know if they did, but they could have argued defensive uh, purposes. They were being attacked uh, across the border from uh, Khmer extremists. Uh, anyhow, that's the second case that had massive benign effects. Uh, none of, neither of these figures in the literature on humanitarian intervention, and there are two reasons. Uh, one reason is wrong agency. Uh, they did it, we didn't do it. So therefore, it, doesn't count. Uh, the second and more powerful reason is that the U.S. was bitterly opposed to both of these interventions and at once moved to punish the perpetrators, uh, sent an aircraft carrier to the Bay of Bengal, threatened India with sanctions, uh, uh, extremely angry at them for doing this. Uh, 
In the case of Vietnam and Cambodia, uh, the Vietnamese were instantly condemned as, you know, the Prussians of Asia and the worst gangsters ever. Uh, the U.S. immediately turned to support of the Khmer Rouge, a military and diplomatic support, uh, backed their position at the uh, United Nations, uh, uh, began to arm them, train them, uh, and in fact uh, supported, openly supported a Chinese invasion to punish the Vietnamese for the crime of uh, ending Pol Pot's atrocities. All on the record, nothing controversial about it, but kind of disappeared from history, to borrow the term of our Latin American clients when they get rid of people, disappear them. So you have to look to find it, but it's there. So obviously these couldn't have been humanitarian interventions, and they're not counted. Uh, I don't want to go on too long because I'd like to leave time for discussion, but let me just end by quoting one of the earliest uh, decisions of the World Court, the International Court of Justice, shortly after it was formed. It was in 1949, and it was on a case of alleged humanitarian intervention. Uh, they, the court uh, rejected the claim, uh, uh, denied the appeal, and said, the court can only regard the alleged right of intervention as the manifestation of a policy of force, such as has in the past given rise to most serious abuses, and such as cannot, whatever be the defects in international organization, find a place in international law. From the nature of things, intervention would be reserved for the most powerful states and might easily lead to perverting the administration of justice itself. I think those words ought to be seriously pondered when one thinks about what's called humanitarian intervention and the actions that are not taken that could be very simple humanitarian intervention. I'll leave it at that. Mike's around somewhere. Hello there. We're going to tag team a little bit for these questions. So we have about half an hour for questions for Professor Chomsky. Um, if, if you'll put your hands up nice and high, state your question loudly, I will solemnly restate your question uh, for the microphone. And uh, we'd, like, we'd like to hear from lots of people. Yes, please. Yeah, and the, the second tier up there. So, so the question is, do you mean the, 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 the use, the American use of the word terrorist to describe? So, so the question is, the use do I, of the word what terrorism. What about the use of the word terrorism? That's an interesting one. Actually, I've written a lot about it, if you're interested, so you can find stuff in print. Uh, I started writing about terrorism in, um, I had, I started writing about it explicitly in 1981. The reason was that uh, Ronald Reagan had just declared a war on terror. Uh, the Reagan administration came into office uh, declaring that uh, a prime focus of its uh, foreign policy would be uh, state-directed international terrorism, uh, plague of the modern age, uh, return to barbarism in our times, uh, on and on. And there was a lot of uh, public uh, you know, literature, Claire Sterling, uh, Jean Kirkpatrick, and so on. So I started writing about it, and I did something utterly disreputable. I used the official definition of the word terrorism from the U.S. Code and Army manuals and British law. They're all approximately the same. Well, if you use that word, if that, the definition, it follows almost immediately that the U.S. is the leading perpetrator of terror, of international terrorism. Britain the second, uh, Israel the third, and so on. Oh, that won't work. Uh, so therefore, uh, this all this work is all, and I gave plenty of examples. It's easy to find them. In fact, Reagan's war on terror has also been disappeared. 
when Bush declared a war on terror in 2001, he was redeclaring it, but you'll have to look hard to find that. The reason is that Reagan's so-called war on terror immediately turned into a vicious terrorist war. Uh, hundreds of thousands of corpses in Central America, um, well over a million in Southern Africa. Uh, Reagan was strongly supporting uh, apartheid South Africa as part of the war on terror. He had to defend South Africa from the African National Congress in 1988. The Pentagon declared it to be one of the more notorious terrorist groups in the world. Uh, obviously, we had to defend South Africans against that. In fact, Mandela himself was just taken off the terrorist list about two years ago. Now he can come to the U.S. without special dispensation. And tens of thousands in the Middle East, and in general, it was a major horror story. So that's wiped out of history. Uh, but uh, an interesting industry developed at that point, early 80s, to try to find a, def a definition of terror. It's considered something extremely difficult to define. So there are academic publications, international conferences, uh, uh, lots of literature trying to somehow define this complex uh, concept. It seems to me there's a very simple definition. It's in the US code, in army manuals, and in British law. Just take that definition, works fine. But there's a problem with that definition. It doesn't differentiate between what we do to them and what they do to us. So therefore, can't be. Uh, so you've got to find a concept of terror which will be restricted to what they do to us, not what we do to them. And that's subtle and difficult. You can see why a lot of academic research and conferences and so on. And we see that all the time. Uh, we just saw it a couple of days ago. Uh, a couple of days ago, there was a commemoration of 9-11. Uh, you know, terrible, horrible terrorist act. Uh, actually, in South America, it's called the second 9-11. The first 9-11 was September 11th, 1973. Uh, that's when uh, uh, U.S. initiated and U.S. supported uh, military coup took place in Chile, uh, overthrowing the parliamentary government, killing the president, installing a vicious military dictatorship, which killed thousands of people, tortured tens of thousands, established an a, a, a international terror center in Chile, which was conducting assassinations all over, and over helping overthrow governments, install uh, similar uh, monstrous uh, regimes. Uh, also brought in a bunch of economists, Chicago boys they're called, who very quickly it drove the country into its worst recession and one of the worst recessions in its history. Uh, well, that's what happened on the first 9-11. Uh, by any dimension I can think of, it was much worse than the second 9-11. But that one's gone from history. Same reason. We did it to them. Uh, and, you know, this just it runs through almost everything you look at. So what do I think about the concept of terrorism? I think there's a perfectly good concept, uh, but it's unusual. It doesn't distinguish, it doesn't make the crucial distinction between our atrocities against them and their far lesser atrocities against us. And therefore, it's a big problem. Uh, how do you deal with that? Yeah, please, uh, down here up front. Do you think the call of intervention to Syrian Arab Republic announced uh, dictator? So the question is, what does Professor Chomsky think about the question of intervention with specific reference to Syria? Syria? Well, uh, nobody has suggested intervention in Syria. Uh, and there's a reason. Uh, the West is, the, the only countries that can intervene are the powerful states. Okay, so uh, uh, the United States, uh, the traditional imperial powers. Uh, there is an imperial triumvirate 
Britain, the United States, and France. They're the traditional imperial powers throughout that whole region. And they could intervene, but they don't want to. Uh, for one thing, because they they prefer Assad to any the president to any uh, uh, likely alternative. So uh, there, there's no question to answer. I mean, we, if if they decided to intervene, we could decide whether it's the right thing to do, and that raises all kind of questions. Uh, same kind of questions that trace back to John Stuart Mill. Uh, what's involved, what are the purposes, what are the likely consequences, and so on. But the questions just don't arise. Yes, please, right, right there, David. Uh, can you give us some idea of what criteria we should use to determine what constitutes a humanitarian crisis? Uh, what criteria we should use to constitute appropriate action and response to a humanitarian crisis? Mm. And what criteria we should use to determine who is the appropriate agency to respond to humanitarian mm. I understand. Well, uh, there are, uh, we really have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. I think it's really hard to find. I mean, you can make some general statements, but the trick is to apply them to particular cases. So let's look at, uh, at the particular humanitarian crises and see what we can do about it, okay? Uh, so take, say, uh, the 1990s the period when the U.S. was in a noble phase of its foreign policy with a saintly glow. Uh, we can look, there were many humanitarian crises then. Uh, one of the worst of them was in Iraq. Uh, U.S. sanctions in Iraq uh, killed hundreds of thousands of people, uh, maybe up to a million people. Uh, they strengthened Saddam Hussein. They uh, under destroyed, they destroyed any possibility of any uprising against Saddam. They forced the population to rely on him for survival. They were so horrendous that the, the administrators of the so-called oil for food program, uh, two distinguished international diplomats, Dennis Halliday, Hans von Sponek, uh, both of them uh, resigned in protest because they regarded the sanctions they were asked to administer as genocidal, okay? Actually, just yesterday, I got a letter from Hans von Sponek uh, thanking me for having brought this up in a discussion in Oslo a couple of days ago, which was about your question. Uh, so yes, uh, that, that there would be an easy way to uh, uh, end that humanitarian crisis, namely, don't take part in it, okay? Okay, that's easy, doesn't cost anything. And there are many like that. Uh, one that was going on at the same time actually was in Turkey, not in the Balkans, uh, inside NATO, not near NATO. Uh, Turkey at that time was carrying out uh, vicious atrocities, trying to suppress a Kurdish uh, protest movement in southeastern Turkey. Uh, Kurds were deprived of the most elementary rights. They they couldn't speak Turkish legally, couldn't have the Turkish colors, anything. Had to pretend to be mountain Turks, as they were called. And there was an uprising, and uh, uh, Turkey launched a counterinsurgency campaign, killed tens of thousands of people, uh, destroyed about 3,500 towns and villages, drove roughly 3 million people, something like that, uh, out of the region. Uh, that was pretty awful. Uh, it was an easy way to stop that, namely stop participating in it. The arms were coming almost entirely from the United States, uh, about 80%. Uh, as the atrocities increased, uh, U.S. arms increased. In the year 1997, which incidentally is the year when Clinton was praised for the noble phase of his foreign policy with a saintly glow in the New York Times, uh, in that year, Clinton sent more arms to Turkey than in the entire Cold War period combined up until the onset of the insurgency. So yes, there's an easy way to stop that one, uh, stop providing the arms. And if you like, I can run through a lot of other cases. So many cases of major atrocities can very easily be stopped by stopping our participation in them. And it works. Uh, one case that illustrated that uh, is the Indonesian invasion of East Timor in 1975. 
uh, authorized by the United States, uh, supported U.S. provided arms. Britain came in, provided, in fact, most of the arms. This one was about as close to genocidal as anything in the post-war period. It was aggression and invasion and occupation. It wiped out maybe a quarter of the population, a third of the population. That went on right through 1999, always with strong U.S. support. Uh, the atrocities there were worse in 1999 than anything reported in Kosovo. And in fact, of course, the background was incomparably worse than anything in the Balkans. Uh, finally, in September 1999, uh, under quite a lot of domestic and international pressure, uh, Clinton quietly informed the Indonesians that the game was over. He told them, you're going to have to leave. They left instantly, a day later. It could have been done for the preceding 25 years. Uh, that's now called a humanitarian intervention in a, with a level of cynicism I don't know how to describe. Uh, so yeah, you could stop that one too. And there are many other cases like that. But those are not the kind of cases that are ever discussed. The only cases that are discussed is what are the criteria when somebody else is carrying out a crime. Okay, that's harder. It's much harder to stop somebody else's crimes than to stop your own. And uh, what are the criteria? Well, you know, difficult criteria. You have to ask what are the purposes? What are the likely consequences? Uh, uh, what are the general effects? Uh, you know, a lot of particular considerations have to be looked at, which are complex. But I don't really, th it could be an interesting question. I don't think there's much point discussing it, frankly, because uh, the question almost never arises. In fact, I can't think of a case where it's arisen. As I said at the very beginning, it's hard to find a case in history of a genuine humanitarian intervention, one carried out for humanitarian goals uh, and with consideration of what the consequences would be. And since if the question doesn't arise, it's very hard to answer. Yes, please, right here, right, right here up front. NATO claimed humanitarian intervention in Libya. Was it? So the question is, was the recent NATO incursion into Libya humanitarian? Well, there were two interventions in Libya. We have to distinguish them. Uh, one was uh, uh, both by the imperial triumvirate. In both cases, it was the U.S., France, and Britain mainly France and Britain, the traditional imperial powers. Uh, the first one had substantial global support. It was authorized by the United Nations. You look at United Nations Security Council Resolution 1973, uh, which had a fair amount of uh, international support. It called for a no-fly zone and actions to protect uh, civilians. As soon as that was passed, came the second intervention, namely the decision of the imperial triumvirate to violate 1973. That's exactly what happened. They instantly intervened, not to protect civilians, and not with a no-fly zone, but to uh, uh, participate in a rebellion. And they participated actively in a rebellion. Uh, finally, the rebellion uh, succeeded with NATO support. So we have to ask which of these interventions we're talking about. In my personal opinion, I wrote about it at the time, I thought that the first one, it could be justified. The decision to uh, institute a no-fly zone and to protect civilians, I thought made sense. In particular, it, it prevented what might have been, we don't know, but it might have been a massacre in Benghazi. The second one is much more difficult. And in fact, it's worth noting that the second one is, did not receive global support. So the African Union opposed, opposed it. It's an African country. Uh, the uh, so-called BRICS countries, developing countries, Brazil, uh, Russia, India, China, South Africa, uh, they strongly opposed it. They had a meeting which they uh, called for uh, negotiations and diplomatic efforts, as did the African Union. Uh, even within NATO, uh, support was pretty tepid. Uh, 
most of Germany didn't participate at all, and other countries did to an extent. Uh, part, of the, part of the formal justification is that the Arab League requested it. That's just not true. Uh, the first intervention, the UN resolution, had limited support from the Arab League. A minority of Arab League countries approved it, mostly the Gulf countries, not the regional ones. Uh, the second intervention is no support from the Arab League. Qatar provided a couple of airplanes, nobody else. The Turkey didn't support it, the major NATO party nearby. And most countries called for uh, negotiations and uh, an effort at diplomacy, which might have worked or might not have. Uh, the actual second intervention, according to the rebel leadership, it killed about 30,000 people. It's not slight. Uh, Libya is a complicated society. It's a tribal society. The, the beginning of the uprising in Benghazi is, you know, a, a region of Libya which is pretty much separated from the tribal society. Uh, the uh, western uprising, uh, Misrata, conquest of Tripoli, that's western tribes, uh, partly you know, Bedouin tribes, uh, be, uh, not Bedouin, uh, Berber tribes, uh, partly Libyan. Uh, they're the ones who did the fighting there, they're kind of bitter. They're the ones who, in fact, now uh, have the military command. It's what, there's an article about it in today's New York Times. Uh, the, uh, uh, right now, it's not being reported much, the NATO is bombing the bases of the largest Libyan tribe, that, which happens to be supportive of Gaddafi. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot to say about it. I mean, I'll, Maybe you can make an argument for it, maybe not, but a case has to be made. I don't think there's even been an effort to make the case. I might mention, as uh, with regard to the Arab League call for a no-fly zone, limited call, at the same time they called for a no-fly zone over Gaza. Well, you, you can see how far that went. Uh, so there's a lot of questions to ask. I don't think there's a simple answer, frankly. But incidentally, as to whether what the goals were, of course, they're professed to be completely humanitarian. But it's worth remembering that when a state claims, a, not only a state, but its intellectual class and others, when they claim to be acting on humanitarian grounds, that statement, in the technical sense, carries zero information. And the reason is it's completely predictable. Uh, that happens all the time. I gave a couple of examples, you know, Hitler, uh, Mussolini, John Stuart Mill, you pick them. Every, just about every use of force is uh, vested in noble humanitarian terms. If something's predictable, it just doesn't carry any information, so you disregard it, you dismiss it, doesn't mean anything. Uh, so then you have to ask, was it really with humanitarian intent? Well, there you have to judge. Uh, one uh, interesting piece of evidence, perhaps, is that the day in which the Western tribes were beginning to enter Tripoli, uh, you take a look at the New York Times, uh, the business section, the lead story in the business section had a title, something like uh, uh, Energy Corporation's uh, Scramble for, uh, to Gain uh, Libyan Oil Contracts. Maybe irrelevant, maybe not. You can decide. But uh, I don't, what, whether it was justified or not, I don't think it begins to meet the criteria for humanitarian intervention. So here in the uh, first balcony on the left, right up, right, right up front, just there, yeah. Um, you said before that you can't visualize or anticipate peace between Palestinians and Israelis being realized. Uh, what do you suggest players in that conflict aspire for, and what do you yourself aspire for in that region? So the question is, what would be a proper resolution to the conflict between the Palestinians and the Israelis? Well, I'm pretty conservative. I still have the same views I had in the 1940s <laughs> when I was a, a Zionist youth leader. Those views were then called Zionist. They're now called anti-Zionist. But the views are approximately the same. Uh, circumstances, of course, changed since the 1940s. So, you know, judgment on what should be done uh, 
at least in the short term, changes. Right now, in fact, for the last roughly 40 years, 35 years to be exact, there's been a, a pretty straightforward, simple, short-term settlement. I wouldn't call it a solution because I don't think it's much of a solution, but at least a settlement that would reduce the cycle of violence, maybe eliminate it, uh, prepare a way for further steps. And everyone knows what it is all over the world. Uh, there's an overwhelming international consensus on it. It's one of the simplest problems in the world to solve from the point of view of uh, not solve, but settle in these terms. And that's a two-state settlement on the international, re internationally recognized border, uh, and I'll quote the official terms, with minor and mutual modifications. Now, that was the position of the United States from 1967 to the mid-70s, at a time when the United States was still part of the world on this issue. So a, uh, a two-state settlement, international border, minor and mutual modifications, uh, straight, straightening out uh, uh, lines from a, a ceasefire lines and stuff. And then various uh, things to do about uh, Jerusalem refugees and so on. As I said, there's overwhelming agreement on that. There's one barrier to it, the same one there's been for 35 years. The United States won't accept it. And, of course, the United States has overwhelming power. Uh, Israel, of course, rejects it but, and can reject it as long as the United States backs them. Uh, so that's a short-term uh, settlement. If it can be instituted, and I don't think it's that hard, frankly. So if the United States, uh, uh, if the United States gives orders to Israel, it has no choice but to accept them. The relations of power make that obvious. And the orders can be pretty simple. Withdraw the army from the occupied territories. Uh, in fact, Human Rights Watch, not a particularly radical organization, has uh, called on the United States to, uh, 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 to withdraw any funding to Israel that has anything to do with the occupied territories or with discrimination within Israel. That's Human Rights Watch. Amnesty International has called for an arms embargo. Well, just simple steps like that would lead Israel to make a decision. Are we going to withdraw the army from the territories where everyone agrees it's criminal occupation, even Israel? Are we going to do that or uh, are we going to withdraw them or uh, are we going to stand alone against the world without the support of the United States? I'm pretty sure what they would do in that case. There have been similar cases before. Uh, then what happens to the half a million settlers? Well, they have a choice, too. Uh, if they can uh, climb into the uh, trucks that uh, Israel will provide for them and move from their subsidized homes in the territories to subsidized homes in Israel. And my guess is probably 90% of them will do that. Uh, there's probably a, a segment of uh, you know, religious Jews from Brooklyn who will want to cling on to every rock. Okay, they can do that. Uh, they'll be in the Palestinian state. It's not a big problem. Uh, what would happen after that? Well, you know, we can only speculate. But my guess is that what would happen after that, at the border, anyone who's been in the region knows that you just can't cut a line through that small territory that makes any sense at all. So my guess is that what would happen is, as has been happening occasionally, is that uh, cultural, commercial, social relations would develop, and gradually over time the border would begin to erode. And you could move towards uh, some sort of binational federation in the former Palestine. Actually, that was my view uh, in the 1940s, and as I say, it still is. And that's not the end of the road either. Uh, sometimes that's called a one-state solution. It's a confusing term. Uh, the, 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 the country itself is bordered by imperial decisions. So the difference, the, uh, Israel and Lebanon are separated by a border that makes no geographical or any other sense. It cuts right across the Galilee, and it was established by the British and the French for their own imperial purposes. Uh, I should say I 
my wife and I lived there for a little while back in the early 50s and we were backpacking up there once and we accidentally crossed into Lebanon. There was no marking of the border and it was the same place. Uh, some guy came by in a jeep and yelled at us and told us to come back. But uh, the, uh, and that's the way it ought to be. There shouldn't be a border there. There should be a broader regional settlement which will integrate both societies into a broader system and maybe that'll happen. And so it's in that context and only in that context that there might be some kind of a solution uh, for the Palestinian refugees abroad. I don't see any other place. So I, th I think that's, those are directions that could be followed. They have to have a first step, uh, which is accepting the international consensus. That's coming up in the UN in a week, in fact, and the US will again block it if it comes up, as it's been doing since uh, it vetoed the first such resolution in 1976. Uh, that's under our control, you know, if uh, this is the kind of, if you like, uh, uh, humanitarian action that can be taken if the American population uh, compels the government to join the world on this. This is painful to say, but we have time for one more question. I should tell you that if you wish to stay behind, Professor Chomsky will be uh, signing books just for a little bit in the lobby outside. Yeah, right down here, up front, please. Um, partition of India, I think, was one of the instances of most unnecessary violence. Uh, how do you think um, Gandhi, Nehru, and Jinnah, that they have the power to initiate a humanitarian intervention, and in particular Gandhi, in that, on, in that event? So, so the question begins with the observation that the partition of India India. The partition of India was unusually violent. Yeah. Uh, so the, the question that follows from that is whether the South Asian leaders of the time, whether the South Asian leaders of the time, and particularly Gandhi, could have mobilized the energies and forces to intervene in, in the midst of that generalized atrocity. Yeah, the partition of India was, of course, done by the British. and. Uh, and for their own interests, not for the interests of the populations. And it was uh, pretty horrible. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people killed, maybe millions, uh, huge emigration, uh, uh, awful consequences going right up to the present. Would anything else have been possible? I mean, yeah, I think other things could have been possible. It wouldn't just have been Gandhi. It had to be uh, Nehru, Jinnah, others with uh, a more humane approach and without the British intervention, maybe something else could have been done. It didn't start in 1947. There's a long background of uh, British uh, support for uh, Muslim nationalism as a weapon against uh, uh, you know, the, the Hindu-based independence movement. Uh, the Churchill in particular just despise the Indians, the Hindus, and, and he was, I mean, you read his, what he wrote about it, it's hair-raising. Uh, he, he, in fact, was substantially responsible for the last major famine in India, the huge famine in 1943, when there was plenty of food around, but uh, he made sure it went to England so that they could have white bread in England instead of, while well, they're starving in Bengal and so on. There's a good book about this that just came out by somebody named uh, Mukherjee, an uh, Indian uh, historian. Uh, and uh, that's part of the background for the partition. It didn't come from nowhere. Could it have been different? You know, I think you can think of ways it could have been different. But I should say that that's one of the problems, unlike the Israel-Palestine one, where it's really hard to think of a settlement, especially in Kashmir, which is the core of the conflict now. Not simple.